So the question is, is your church, and this is not to be snipey with anybody, just to ask you, is your church new age, emergent, or Christian? Maybe you have loved ones or friends who are caught up in the cults or who are caught up in liberal theology or who may be new agers. And there are new agers, of course, everywhere these days. It just isn't a northwest to California phenomena like it was in the 70s when I was a practicing new ager. But uh, with liberal theology out there, with cults and cultic ideas out there, maybe some of what I'll bring up this evening will be questions or at least conversations you should have with them, whether it's questions you need to ask them, but conversations that you need to have. Because if, if we don't talk to the folks who believe these other things, who's going to? That's the question. Who's going to? Please don't leave it just for me to do because I'm not going to ever meet all those folks. And you have to, um, you have to ask, is, is what I believe, first of all, solid biblically? And then what about those around me who I love and who I'm concerned for? Is it new age, emergent, or Christian? I never dreamed that I would put these phrases, these terms together, new age Christians. New age Christians. Now, they're not calling themselves that. It'd be a lot simpler uh, if... All the cults and all the schisms out there were like the Mormons and wore little badges to tell you what they were. But it doesn't work like that. We want to separate truth from error in the day that we live in. And we're called to do that. That we not be taken captive and that we understand. It's more than just protecting ourselves in our homes. It's also so we understand what to, what to do and say and how to get through to the people who who are lost in these other belief systems. But it is shocking when you put these words together. New Age Christians, how could that be? How could it emerge so quickly? So we'll start with Scripture, Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, very famous apologetics passage. It says, but though we are an angel from heaven, this is the Apostle Paul speaking, obviously, writing, but though we are an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And then he does something he doesn't do elsewhere. This is very rare in Scripture. And Paul repeats himself. It's almost like he thought they didn't hear him the first time. But this is to add extra emphasis, weight upon what he's saying. He's saying this is an important thing. Drop everything and listen. He says here, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received, let him be accursed. Just not the false teaching that is accursed, notice, it is the one who's bringing it as well. Paul is throwing the gauntlet down here and saying, if you are buying into anything that we didn't teach you, then you have gone the wrong direction. What he's really saying here is, if I come back and try to amend something that I already taught you, don't listen to me. If Timothy or Barnabas or others come and they try to change what we've already taught, don't buy it. Because there's only going to be one gospel that's authentic. Lots of counterfeits, but only one authentic gospel. And Paul's making this point in this very important passage. Jude verses 3 and 4 in this one chapter book. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Let's stop right there. If the faith isn't under attack, why would we have to contend for it? So even at that early stage in church history, the faith was under attack. And of course, God knew it was going to continue to be under attack. Contending for the faith. Not being contentious. As Jan Markell often says, contending for the faith. For there are certain men crept in unawares, people that got into our midst, in other words, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So there are going to be people in our midst, sitting in the pews, maybe even in the pulpits, certainly in the Sunday school classes, even if they still exist in some churches. There are going to be people around us in church that aren't going to necessarily believe the same thing we are and may try to even pervert the belief system of others. So we need to understand 
that we've been warned again and again, and there are just two of the passages in the New Testament that tell us to be careful about what we believe. Belief systems are important. This isn't just believe whatever you want to believe and attach Jesus' name to it and claim you're a Christian. Anybody can claim to be a Christian. But if you are producing fruit, the fruit that Scripture talks of, and if you are ascribing to the central doctrines of the faith, and we can have disagreements on some of the peripheral doctrines, as they're called, we, we can disagree on some things, but Paul's making a point here, the central doctrines, believing in those things, believing in the things he had taught to the Galatians, that's important. In fact, that's bedrock. So, what we've got here is a warning to accept only the gospel. That's what we see in Galatians 1, 8, and 9, and also in Jude. And the absolute assurance that false teachers are going to invade the church. Now, I know that's unsettling to us, but anybody here who's seasoned, who's been a Christian for long, is already aware that this can happen. You think about where, where the cults came from. Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mind Sciences, uh, the Unity School of Christianity that my mom was a member of before she got saved, nine months before she passed away. Praise the Lord. The Mormon Church and on and on, all of them sprung from some sort of what we would know or call Christianity. Whether we want to call it biblical Christianity is another story. You'd have to examine each one. But all of those cults came out of there. That means there were people sitting there who were ripe and willing to go out and follow false gospels. That meant that the cult leaders themselves were a part of the church system. So I don't want us to be paranoid about those who are sitting around us, so please don't start looking at them, you know, out of the side of your eye. It isn't them I'm necessarily talking about. I'm just saying it is going to happen. People who don't believe but who claim to believe are going to be part of the church system. Now, I don't necessarily think they would want to come to this conference. But uh, this is what happens, and this is what is going on. It has gone on since the church began. You know, Peter warns us in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1 about false prophets and false teachers, that they will come, the same as what it says there in Jude. And Paul warned the Ephesian elders... You think about what Paul says to the Ephesian elders as he was having his last words with him, with them. He he knew, I think prophetically, that he wasn't going to come back. When he got on the boat and sailed away, that he was gone and would not see them again. And he gives them a final charge. He he, uh, in fact, incorporates the gospel message in the words that are recorded in Scripture in Acts chapter 20. But then he says, after my departing, grievous wolves are going to enter in. And then he says, among you. And he's talking to the elders of the church. And then he says, also, some of you are going to become the cult leaders right here after I leave. You're going to begin to twist doctrines and twist the gospel. He warns them very carefully. And I'm sure in that moment, many of them looked around and wondered if it was who he could be talking about. When we're the elders of the church. Who would it be? Well, Paul warned them. Jesus warns us an astounding 14 times about false teaching and false teachers. Did you know that? Most of those passages are never read in the lukewarm churches or in the liberal churches or in the happy-go-lucky churches or in the feel-good gospel churches or in the emergent churches. Those warnings aren't given. And so those people, unless they're reading on their own and learning on their own, probably don't think there's too much to worry about. You see, unless the pastor at the pulpit, unless the shepherd is warning the sheep or is teaching the truth from the Scripture, the, the entirety of the Scripture, um, most of the people sitting in the pews these days don't think there's anything to worry about. That's why uh, when I mention to some pastors and some people when I see the look on their face when I say, well, I, I talk about uh, spiritual warfare and they immediately, they're, oh. And I, I talk about the cults and the occult and then, oh, more. And then I, I talk about eschatology and the study of biblical end days. And at that point, they're running <laughs> because they've not heard about it from the pulpits. You know, I was over in, in Calgary and invited to come speak at a church after I spoke at a gathering similar to, to this one on a Saturday. And uh, 
I spoke on 10 reasons why I believe Jesus is returning soon. It's one of our DVDs. It's something I had considered talking about here on Sunday. But I'm going to talk about technology and surveillance and how all that works together in these end times instead. But I talked about these 10 reasons. And there could be 110 reasons, as you know, if you know much about eschatology. And the story was told to me by the pastor himself some weeks later. And he said, as I sat there listening to you, he was on the front row, listening to me on that Sunday night, it was like God spoke to him so clearly that he had not warned his people about the end days and eschatology. And he began a weekly Sunday night study on eschatology just because I happened to preach that message that night. And I, that's no credit to me. It was what God did. And God can do a lot of things. And thankfully, he doesn't, he doesn't need us to be sparkling and wonderful and perfect to do it. Amen? He wants to use us. But that spurred that man on to be able to, to warn his congregation and preach on the end times and give them understanding of, of the events, some of what you've um, already heard from Brother Steve. We shouldn't be shocked. We shouldn't be surprised in the day that we live in when we see false teachers arise and become popularized as Christians and then draw disciples away to follow them. I've seen it happen in local churches that I've been a part of. Not necessarily cult leaders, but cult-like things as people would, would be drawn to somebody and then before long there'd be some sort of a split and something would go on and I guess you could call that cult-like. It certainly could be. We also, by the way, should not be disturbed or surprised when biblical Christians, hopefully that's all of us here, expose both the false teachers and the false teaching because we are commanded to do that. And it's not pretty. I don't relish in it. Nobody relishes on the idea of calling somebody out over what they're teaching or believing. But if we don't try to if we don't try to lay down a barrier to try to stop them, they're going to just continue on. And if we really care about the eternity of people, we're going to speak up. And we're going to make ourselves vulnerable in the process. I, I, I'm a little off track here, but I feel like I've got to say that to some of you. Because honestly, it's not a, it's not a pretty thing to think you have to evangelize people in church. But there's a lot of people in our churches need to be evangelized. It's not a pretty thing to call somebody out. Because you know they're following particular teachers or particular teaching. But we are commanded to call out the teaching and the teachers for the sake of the sheep. So let me define terms a little bit just for a minute. And then I'm probably going to move on pretty quickly. I have my cheat sheet so I can kind of jump ahead if I need to later on. What is the New Age movement? You know, there was a time when I thought everybody had already heard. Uh, because I'd seen the seminars and I had the VHS tapes and I'd read the books and being a New Ager before I got saved, I'd read everything I knew about. I read the early, early first books out in the Christian church about the New Age movement and I was sure everybody knew what it was. And then as time went on, even though I thought, well, there's no reason for me to worry about putting a book or a DVD on the table or anything like that back in those days, VHS tape. And... Uh, as time went along, I would start using the term or phrase New Age Movement during my messages, and I had the distinct impression that some of the people there just didn't understand what I was talking about. And I, a couple of times I stopped and asked, how many of you understand what the New Age Movement is? Could you give a definition for what it is? And a few hands raised like this, and most people just shook their heads no, and I thought, oh boy, here we are. Another generation has come that doesn't know, so I started talking about it again. So that's why I'm going to define this so we all understand at least what my definitions are, and, and they aren't all the definitions for the New Age, but it'll give you an idea at least where I'm coming from. It is westernized Eastern mystic thought. It is brought to us in a package that we here in the West would accept. But it really is Eastern mysticism with different words, and it's not brought to us necessarily with a, um, a Maharishi in a long flowing robe and a turban on. It's not brought like that. It's brought to us in college campuses and in the classrooms and that kind of thing. It's brought to us in business. It's brought to us in the medical community. We see it all through the culture. It's a spiritual experience without the cost of repenting of your sin. A spiritual experience... 
That doesn't require you to repent of your sin. Humanism plus spiritualism would equal the New Age movement. The humanist community has generally been shrinking. The spiritualist community has been joining with it because humanists are looking for a spiritual experience. Many of them wouldn't understand exactly what's going on, but they're drawn to it and maybe don't know why. But they're looking for that, as once somebody once called it, God-shaped hole that humans have when they don't have Jesus. They're looking for something to fill that. And they're finding the counterfeit. So humanism plus spiritualism is the New Age movement. And there's a lot more than just that definition. But that'll give you an idea. So what is the emergent church? I said this afternoon. The emerging or emergent church is a movement that takes its name from the idea that the culture has changed. Thus, a new church must emerge in response to the culture. And what they've done is just not decide to do church a new way. They've decided to throw the doctrines of the faith out and then redefine them on the way as they do that. And so that's what emergent would be. And we talked about some of this today. And I'm going to repeat myself just slightly from this afternoon for the sake of those who are here tonight. Uh, I wrote a um, pretty well-traveled pamphlet called How to Spot the Emergent Church in Your Church. And you can download that on my website. It's also in my booklet back there on the Emergent Church uh, and on the DVD as well. And uh, I said in that, in that pamphlet, the emergent Christians, what they would say they believe or they, they have as Christianity is that experience is more important than reason, that spirituality is more important than doctrine and certainly more than absolutes, that images are more important than words, feelings over truth, earthly justice more than salvation, and social action is more important than talking about eternity. And those are just six of the things I, I list in that particular pamphlet. You can find it online at uh, ericbarger.com slash spot, S-P-O-T dot PDF. And you'll find it. Actually, it's on our homepage. You can find it there. The emergent church movement is a redefinition of Christianity. It is the new liberalism. I said that earlier today. And emergent leaders have decided that classical, historical, biblical Christianity doesn't fit into their worldview. So they've elected to use the shell of the church, but not the truth of, of Christianity. They use the shell. They use some of the words, but they've redefined them. And we need to be sharp and understand that because uh, in Cults 101... Walter Martin never called it that, but that's really what it was. He taught that the first thing the cults do is pick up phrases and words that we think we understand what it means because we're familiar with those terms and it makes us comfortable. So they use the words, but then they attach a radically different meaning to the words. And that's what has happened in the postmodern emergent movement. I mentioned this afternoon that I had gone to a Brian McLaren conference at Northwest Nazarene University back in 2008. And that's a picture I took with my very old flip phone. Some of you remember those. On, oh, yeah, some of you may still have one. But anyway, that's another story. But uh, this is a picture I took, not a very good one, but that is Brian McLaren in the brown shirt down below. And he's making an example of something up on the screen. And uh, in going to that, it was really an eye-opener. I, I knew already by reading his book what I was going to hear, but it was more stunning to hear it direct from him and watch 300 people, many of them students, and many of them my age back then in those days when I was mm, in my 50s, all oh, the good old days. But anyway, I, I was shocked to watch as people agreed so much. I mean, myself and the fellow who was with me who was a pastor and maybe one other couple they were the only ones that I knew were there on a fact-finding mission who weren't in agreement with him. But it was as Everything Must Change to her. That was the name of one of his books. It was in Boise, Idaho, back in 2008, Northwest Nazarene University. And I mentioned what kind of what he talked about. And I talked about, I said this Saturday night session earlier today. And when I saw this slide earlier is at, at dinner, I went, oh, it was a Friday night session. But I remembered what happened. They uh, passed out uh, uh, the words on sheets. And the words to the songs they sang were morbid. There was no worship of God. There, it was all about how rotten we were and how much we would messed up the planet. And, you know, it was our fault. And we had to do something to make it right. It, really, it, it was something any Wiccan priest could have sung along with. And he, would, he or she would have had no problem. A, a Wiccan would have had no problem with that stuff. And then they played a film by the Sierra Club. And... 
I knew they were part of McLaren's team because I saw their booth out in the lobby. They were helping sponsor his tour. You know, the Sierra Club, that wonderful evangelical association. You don't know who they are. Yeah, they're hyper-environmentalists in the States, but I'll move on. And then he began what turned out to be that night a complete redefinition of previously orthodox terms. My friend Chris and I both took copious notes that night. He was a, a pastor and sadly has passed away a couple of years ago and he was a good friend. But we took copious notes as McLaren just went down the list redefining Christianity. He said that evening that the phrase kingdom of God was a political term and not a spiritual term or phrase. And he, was, he said Jesus was calling for a peace network, an ecosystem for God, or God's global love economy, and it was up to us to make it come to pass. Funny, I, I'd never had that told to me that that's what the kingdom of God was. He said the word salvation is about us saving the planet. These are things I wrote down that evening that I heard. And Chris and I shared our notes with each other to make sure we'd heard the right things. He wrote about it and I wrote about it and both of our articles from, those, uh, from that meeting are still on my website. You'll find them. McLaren said that the phrase the world, like when John 3.16 talks about the world, it really means planet earth. No, it doesn't. When Jesus is talking about the world, for God so loved the world, he's talking about the human beings that reside on it. But McLaren said, no, he was talking about the earth. And you have to make that kind of twist if you believe that our mission as Christians is to be here to save the planet. McLaren said, for the first time through the Eastern Jesus, I began to have a glimpse of how Jesus could indeed be a savior of not just a few individual humans, but of the whole world. Now, if you look at that, and you think that he's referring to some sort of universalism that everybody is saved in the end, which would be wonderful, except it's not what the Bible says at all. It's what Paul Young in the shack taught, but it's, it's not what the scripture teaches. He's not talking about universalism here. I can tell you how I know that. Because in a footnote in his own book, he writes a note about what he means in the page, on page 66 in his book, A Generous Orthodoxy. It is rare that I know of any author who writes a footnote about what he's saying in a page to clarify it. Usually you do that in the text of the book. But McLaren put a footnote in saying, by the whole world, I do not necessarily mean every individual in it. So he's not talking about the salvation of everybody in some sort of universalistic idea. He said, but rather I mean the cosmos, creation, the earth, and history. When he's talking about the world, he wanted to make sure nobody missed the idea that he thinks we ought to be here to save the planet, that that's the job and mission of the church. That is not the job and mission of the church. Especially when you consider, as I pointed out today, the revelation tells us the earth is going to burn. <laughs> that is not the, that doesn't mean we ought to be bad, bad ecologists and go out and litter. That, that doesn't mean that at all. I'm just pointing out the mission of the church is not to see the planet saved. That's a shock to some young people if they've never heard about this stuff. At the close of the Friday night session, like I pointed out earlier today, and you'll see the circle, even though the picture doesn't depict it very well, there is a vat there, and there is a tub there, and the vat is full of water, and McLaren told people if they have really understood what the new Christianity, that was his phrase, the new Christianity is all about, come on down and take water out of the vat and baptize yourself into the new Christianity. And then come down and his words, put your hands in the tub to see what needs to be saved. And the tub was full of dirt. You're supposed to connect with the dirt to see what needs to be saved. Pretty amazing. But I watched it with my own eyes. And then he turns around, he wheels around to this mural of, of John and Charles Wesley, and he points at the Wesleys. And he says, John Wesley, if he were alive, he'd be an emergent leader. And at that point, I still had another day of this conference to go, but that was just like I was on the edge of that's all I can stand, and I wanted to stand up and just yell, heresy! And I thought, isn't there any Nazarenes here willing to do that? Considering how the Nazarenes view the Wesleys, but nobody moved. Nobody said a word. 
So in New Age philosophy, Jesus is a keeper of knowledge, a great religious sage, but he's not the savior of lost souls. Because in New Age philosophy, it's about coming back over and over and over. Same stuff my mom believed. She thought she'd come back again and again and again and again. And when I got saved, I started talking to her on the phone, which usually ended up in her hanging up on me. And that went on for a couple of years. And then she was delivered to the University of Washington Hospital in the middle of the night with a tumor that had opened up and began to bleed that she didn't know she had. And with my wife on one side of the bed and me on the other side of the bed, I said, Mom, let's not argue about the stuff that we have talked about so often. I know what you believe right now, but I know what you believed, or at least what you embraced before. Because I'd read my mother's Bible that was marked up and she writes in the, in the margins or wrote in the margins just like I had been doing even though I'd never seen that she did it until I went to my grandmother's and visited and I saw the, the stuff she had underlined, the notes she had written. My mom knew the truth. She knew the truth. And that morning in the hospital with us holding hands with her, she received Christ. Then she came to live in our home until they could do more, no more for her. And nine months later, she went to heaven. But I've got great news. There's a reunion ahead for me. And you know the way I used to pray for my mom, and this is for somebody in this room right now. I used to pray, God, don't let it be a heart attack or a car wreck. Give her another chance. That's the way I prayed for my mom after I got saved. And I'll be... If prayer doesn't work, imagine that. And God gave her a second chance. He gave her that chance. You know, all of this really for you tonight is to alert you about this redefinition. That's kind of what today was about earlier too. What we've got to remember is we take our Bibles and we, we don't beat people up with them and we don't become snippy and we don't be argumentative, but we look in Scripture for ourselves to make sure that we understand what the truth is and then we test everything that comes along and every new wind of doctrine, every belief that comes around, especially that which claimed to be Christian, let alone the stuff that you know isn't, you take it all to see if it matches the Scripture. That's what we've got to do lest we be taken captive, let alone the people around us. Test everything. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 and 22. Now, some of the uh, emergent guys, in fact, the key leaders in the early part of the movement, by the way, um, you know, that's not Dave Ramsey, you know, the financial guy that's on radio Looks like him. People think it's him. It really does. Look, that's, that's Brian McLaren. I should have clarified that. And Doug Padgett over there, they were both a part of the Young Leadership Network, which is a part of the Leadership Network from Christianity Astray magazine. I'll let that just sink in for a second. Astray. Well, anyway, you, I guess you're just not with that, are, are you, tonight? Okay, so anyway, these guys were a part of the young leadership, and they, they began to have these, these uh, discussions about why the millennial age kids, they didn't call them that back then, but why were the 20-something people missing from church? And they, they were trying to figure out how they could bring them back. And they began to have these discussions, and according to someone who was a part of those, those discussions, they started saying, well, maybe God really doesn't know the future. Well, we're in trouble if he doesn't. But God does know the future. And they were, they were subjecting these ideas. They were putting them out and just seeing what everybody else thought about them. Uh, maybe gender really isn't that important and doesn't come with distinction was one of the things. Hmm. Maybe homosexuality really isn't a sin. Maybe we've been too hard on people about these things. Maybe we're really not sinners by nature. That's the discussions they were having. It's no wonder they came to the conclusion that we're here to save the planet because it was obvious they weren't interested in seeing anybody else saved. And then they started asking if the central doctrines were just dividing us rather than bringing us together. And they began to read the passage about the unity that Jesus wanted us to have. But that unity can never be achieved if it's achieved on a false basis. Unity can only happen when it's based around the truth of God's word. 
Not when we decide that, we, that God's word doesn't matter anymore and we want unity at all cost. So they started looking at the doctrines of the faith and that's how it went sideways. And then before long, they thought this is a way to bring those people back to church. It became a church growth lure to those people. It all started with this kind of conversation. They reduced Christianity to a conversation. Let me show you where else that is in, in, in the history of Christianity. Back in Genesis 3, God's word was reduced to a conversation too. Half God said, it went. Half God said, see, that's when we begin to doubt or deny the truth of the scriptures. It is not God where the problem is. It is not the dilemma we face by seeing people not in our churches or leaving our churches on Sundays. It is us who begin to doubt the truth of God's word. And we take away his omnipotence and how he can draw the people that we are so longing to see come to church. If we'll let him do it. But once we get them there, we had best give them the truth of the gospel again and again and again faithfully. Because what, why would we want to have every seed in the church full and teach something that couldn't resolve the sin problem that every human has? You see, and that's the problem. These guys begin to look for answers in the wrong place. Emergents claim to be evangelicals. They claim to be us. But they sought to question and then just simply ignore God's word. And you know how many different Bibles there are. I believe Ken said there's 200 of them this morning. And I'm sure they're working on some somewhere. But they have an emergent Bible. There's several of them. There's a green Bible. That's an environmental Bible. This one, The Voice, was edited by some of these same people. Brian McLaren included. Donald Miller, one of the original emergents. Well... Emergent evangelicalism and New Age mysticism really have a lot of things that cross the tracks back and forth in these two movements. The underlying spiritual foundation of emergent evangelicalism is a rejection of Orthodox Christianity and the integration of mystical beliefs and practices in the place of many things in the church. And I said today earlier we would talk about labyrinths and yoga and chanting and Eastern mystical techniques and I'll stop right there. And just ask you, how many of you right now, before I explain anything, know what a labyrinth is? Would you raise your hand? Good. I would expect that from this crowd. How many of you here know somebody? I'm not asking you. If, you, if you're that somebody, you can answer, but I'm not going to ask you who it is. How many of you know somebody who's practicing yoga right now? Okay. This is good we're talking about this. The validation of these practices and many more that I won't even mention are really the idea that ancient Christians did these things. And these people are claiming because the books they've read have claimed these very things and have cited instances from four and five hundred years ago that ancient Christians did these things and this is a way to the higher spirituality. So they're seeking some sort of spirituality in this. Well, the labyrinth has, has been used by ancient and modern mystics to achieve what is called a contemplative state. And some of you here know about the phrase and term contemplative prayer. The idea that you go into another state of consciousness during prayer and you bring yourself into that. They believe that by walking through this maze that you, you find the meaning of life and you, you become, you, 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 you see yourself differently, you see something differently differently. And really, the, the root of this thing is where the problem is. In fact, uh, one of the most famous labyrinths that I know of is at Edgar Cayce's foundation property in, Mer in uh, I almost said Myrtle Beach, Virginia Beach, Virginia. Edgar Cayce may be the most famous psychic of the 20th century. And they have a, a labyrinth. You can find it online and find lessons about it. Spending time in meditating in the labyrinth will supposedly, it will give you a relaxed mental attitude and you'll have the end for the search for whatever life may mean. But really, this is a meditation form outside of Christianity. That's the point. There are a lot of things we can do that aren't necessarily talked about in Scripture. Um, when I'm having a tough day, if I can't just feel like I've got the mind of Christ by what the scripture is speaking to me and I've got it, I need answers or whatever. It's been, it's been my, uh, my habit, my practice to go out and get in the car and drive. That's not in the scripture. 
But for whatever reason, I begin to think better. There are two places that I get great ideas, or at least, well, I think they're great. My dog uh, just passed away. She thought they were great. So there, there are some people that thought my ideas were okay. But there's two places that I, can, I think I can get ideas. One of them is in the shower, and one of them is behind the wheel, and I can't write ideas down either place. <laughs> True story. I don't know how many times I have dripping wet run out of the shower to try to get the pad out and write some, something down before I lose it. But these ideas, these meditation ideas we see, they're being forwarded around the church, around the emergent church, around the new evangelicals, whatever term they're using. Because the word emergent isn't being used much by these people. Because we've found out about them and we talk negatively and they've taken a bad rap over it. So they have just decided to back away from that term. You won't find them calling themselves emergents anymore. But in, in the New Age movement, we were looking for a contemplative state. And I recognize it's the very same thing I was looking for 45 years ago. I was looking for that thing, that, that spiritual experience, because, well, I'd taken enough psychedelics in those days. I'm not proud of it, but I took a lot of psychedelics in those days. And I was looking for something to give me that same rush or experience or that same vista that I wanted but I didn't want the, uh, the drugs with it. And so we called it centering. And they still call it centering today. In the occult, it's called altered states. But it's exactly the same thing. And it's being practiced by people in supposedly evangelical churches. This is a picture of Bible college students who are at the stations of the labyrinth. And they are meditating in those stations. And this, is, this, by the way for a long time was on the Treveca Nazarene University website and they've taken it off. And I don't know why. I don't think the labyrinth lab that they have there went away, but they've taken it off their website. Labyrinths have their basis in Greek mythology, Egyptian, Cretan th mythology, and in Tantric Buddhism. They do not have their roots in biblical Christianity. If they were brought in by the ancient Christians, it wasn't because they were so biblically minded to test these things. It's because they found out something that we can't miss. Listen carefully. The occult works. The New Age movement works. Some of these techniques we're talking about here work. That's not the issue. By what spirit they're working is what we have to ask. By what spirit does this stuff happen when people go into these altered states of consciousness? Rob Bell talked about it in several of his NUMA DVD series. They were very, very popular 10, 15 years ago in the church. Very popular. Talked about it in the Breathe DVD where he was teaching, talking about breathing techniques. And here he was talking about Jesus in one sentence and then yoga masters in another sentence. And how the yoga masters were teaching the same stuff Jesus was. I've never been able to understand, especially after coming out of the New Age stuff, I can't understand how he can make that relationship. But he makes it because he's trying to make a case for this stuff. He wants us to take our cues from Hindu masters instead of from the Bible. So you have to understand, but of course, he went to work on, with Oprah on Oprah's network, so we know the kind of discernment that Rob Bell has already. Come on, folks. Amen? <laughs> About Christian yoga, by the way, that, that's a phrase just like Christian cocaine that I said today earlier. That just doesn't go, now. Christian yoga. An instructor associated with the Classical Yoga Hindu Academy stated... Is yoga a religion that denies Jesus Christ? Yes. Think about that. Is yoga a religion that denies Jesus Christ? This instructor said yes. Just as Christianity denies the Hindu Mahadevas such as Siva, Vishnu, Gurda, and uh, Krishna, and those are some of the main gods in Hinduism, to name a few, Hinduism and its many yogas have nothing to do with God and Jesus. And he goes on and says, as Hindus who live the yogic lifestyle, we appreciate when others understand that all of yoga is about the Hindu religion. Now, I don't know if any of you here have been dabbling in or gotten into the practice of yoga and the habit of it, but that's where it comes from. And you need to hear that. It comes directly from Hinduism. 
I know people would say, but I really don't practice the religion. I'm just doing it for the posturing and the stretching. And I can think of a lot of things we can do besides the Hindu positions that will give us the same kind of health benefits. Modern so-called yoga is dishonest to Hindus, this fellow says, and to all non-Hindus such as Christians. Because what we've got here in our culture is packaged in a very, uh, very hip way where people who, who want these things, you know, they're looking for something to exercise with and it's cool, everybody does it and so on. Well, if everybody's jumping off the cliff, I don't want to be cool and follow them. And this is really akin to jumping off the cliff spiritually. Doug Padgett, Minnesota, Solomon's Porch, a couple thousand people. They have a yoga center in that church. His wife is the instructor. Is his wife's, quote, ministry. Now, I, I want to stop and back up on Doug Padgett just for a second. I was a part of writing a book that was just released three weeks ago called Deceivers. And... Um, there was 12 authors, Dan Markell was one of them, myself, Billy Crone, several others. And I wrote about Doug Padgett and the Yoga Center in my part of that book. I'm in the last chapter in the book. And praise God, by the way, it was number one on Amazon's Kindle list yesterday and number two on the actual printed hard copy. So I'm excited about it for Terry James, who's the editor of the book. But Doug Padgett and others, I mean, think about this is a double whammy. We have an emergent church, emergent leader, drawing the kids in, and then his wife's got a yoga, a yoga school. What about Lectio Divina? This is uh, similar to mantras in Roman Catholicism. And we take the cue from Roman Catholicism to bring this in. And uh, you, you begin to read these things through and read what the definitions are and you begin to understand that and you begin to see Christians do it. It's alarming when you recognize what's going on because people are looking for spiritual experiences in all the wrong places. Following this road leads people to experimental, experiential mysticism to new age and also into the world of the occult. And I'm not saying everybody who practices yoga is going to end up as an occultist. I'm just saying, this is where it's going. Do you want to mess with that? So contemplative, centering prayer, all those things, these are spiritual experiences that have overruled truth in the lives of people that if they were reading their, their Bibles and if they were receiving the teaching about Christianity, they wouldn't have let it happen. That's the point, if they were receiving authentic Christian teaching. Richard Foster is a name that's been around for a long time. He's one of the leaders in this movement. I want you to note that the gurus of Eastern thought and, and shamans elsewhere, he's talking about them and calling them spiritual directors in his life. So he has changed terms that we may not understand but all he's done is reattach a new phrase or a new word to the people he's learning these techniques from. It's really much the same thing as if you came with me to Yelm, Washington, and we went out to Jay-Z Knight's property, and you paid her $1,000 to have a session where Ramtha, a 35,000-year-old Lemurian warrior, is brought up, and she then speaks and acts as if she's a man. And whether she's doing that as a charlatan or whether it's real, either way, it's not pleasing to God. Jay-Z Knight's made a lot of money, but on TV a lot, by selling this kind of activity. The spirit guides that Richard Foster is talking about is the same thing that happens in the world of the occult. It's deception by re-identification. And I think that, again, is a key for us to understand. Just changing the names to change the perception, a retooling of the aversion that we would have to mysticism or that many homes would have to it. I'm going to move on. Dallas Willard, Ruth Haley Barton. There's a list of these people. Dallas Willard passed away not long ago. Who write about this and who, are, who have been the leaders in this movement, in the contemplative movement. But where did these emergent thinkers get their ideas and who is really leading the movement now? Well, it's interesting. They got them right from the celebrated Catholic mystics. From Thomas Merton, Thomas Keating, Henry Nouwen. And you'll see this being reflected again and again as these people are mentioned in the writings of Doug Padgett and others. 
Now, this is Thomas Merton, an American Catholic writer and mystic, a Trappist monk, a poet, and a social activist. He died in 1968, credited with popularizing and mainstreaming the middle Age concept of contemplative prayer, borrowing it from Zen Buddhism, Sufi Islam, and other mysticism. This is Thomas Keating. You know, there were... I believe there were four, as the Pope called them, great Americans mentioned in the Pope's speech um, in New York at the UN. And Thomas Keating was one of them. Along with Dor Dorothy, I'm sorry, Dorothy Day. Anybody here know the name Dorothy Day? I'm just curious. Dorothy Day was a communist. And yet the Pope named her as a great American along with John F. Kennedy and Abraham Lincoln. Well, Thomas Keating, a Trappist monk, the only one of these three main mystics who's still living, as far as I know he's still alive, known as one of the architects of centering prayer, a contemporary method of contemplative prayer that emerged from the St. Joseph's Abbey in Massachusetts in 1975. And Henry Nowen, is the, uh, he's the main name of these. And he died in 1996, a spiritualist, a professor, a writer, a Catholic priest, most influential to the emergence of all. In fact, uh, Nowen himself was very influential across the church. Deceased Catholic priest, now popularized in the writings of, you guessed it, Rick Warren, who quoted him more than once in The Purpose Driven Life, and also Francis Chan, in crazy love. Now and is still one of the most popular of these people. He was a blatant Buddhist sympathizer and he saw the bridge to Eastern mysticism through the silence of contemplative prayer. He was also a universalist and he, we find out after his death, was a homosexual too. Now and in his last book, which was called Here and Now on page 22, he said, the God who dwells in our inner sanctuary is the same as the one who dwells in the inner sanctuary of each human being. If that isn't universalism, friends, I don't know what is. But this is a guy who has been leading the emergent crew the direction they're going. He said, today I personally believe that while Jesus came to open the door to God's house, all human beings can walk through that door whether they know about Jesus or not. Today I see it as my call to help every person claim his or her own way to God. That was page 51 in the sabbatical journey. Now, there's only one way, isn't there? There's only one path, only one way. Jesus said, I am the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. In 1994, a survey of 3,400 Protestant leaders, that would be pastors across America, they ranked Henry now in second to Billy Graham in influence to them. And we wonder now why we're paying the price for the next generation buying into this with Rick Warren and Bill and Lynn Hybels being a backer, a, a, um, a follower, I would say, of Henry Nowen. So how is this being promoted? Like I said, it's ancient, it's authentic, it's biblical. You hear all those things. People say these things, but they don't have anything to back that up. This is what they want to believe it is. The validation of all these practices that ancient Christians employed, they say, is the reason they want to do it today. And once again, I just want somebody to take me back to the first century and show me where that stuff that we just talked about was practiced in the first century. Because it wasn't. You see, that's the thing. That's the big problem. That's the obstruction. You won't find these things in the first century. You're not going to find it in the extra-biblical writings of the, uh, the age of the apologist, which is the second and third century. You're not going to find any of them talking about it in a positive way, nor are you going to find these things in the pages of inspired scripture, in the Bible. And that is, of course, the issue for us today. And I'm running out of time, and I knew I would be here. That's why I tried to, to uh, slim this thing down some, maybe not quite enough. I want to pull ahead because I, I want you to see, before we run out of time, I want you to see an example of how closely aligned emergent evangelicalism is with New Age thought. And a great example would be to take the cult that my mom was a part of, the Unity School of Christianity, and quote them and then quote some emergence and see if they don't sound a lot alike. So we have the Unity Village, Missouri, Unity School of Christianity, which is not Christian. It is a New Age cult. And uh, like I said, one that my mom followed for about 20 or 25 years thereabouts. 
I drive by there often because I leave a vehicle parked in Missouri so I can fly in and get it and then do a circuit and come back. And, but I have a vehicle there right now. Not at Unity Village, by the way. Okay. <laughs> but I have one in the area. This is Duke Tufty. He was the president of the Unity School of Christianity, also the pastor of their largest church, Unity Temple in the Square. And uh, Duke Tufty was asked by the Kansas City Star for an interview. So he said, sure. And they began to ask him questions. This is the Kansas City Star back in 1998. I realize that's a while ago, but this is a great example for you. On the identity of God, Duke Tufty said, you, speaking to the reporter or to the people who would be reading or to us, you are an expression of God's spirit, of the oneness that exists with you and God. Life is an experience of the oneness that exists with you and God. So we are all part of an ethereal God force, according to Duke Tufty of the New School of Christianity. Well, that's very much the same stuff that Leonard Sweet writes about. And he is a Christian futurist right in the middle of the emergent movement. He writes about the Christ consciousness, how we're all, we're, we're, we're locked into the Christ consciousness. And he's featured by Rick Warren in some of his conferences, both in Atlanta and also in California. And it's no wonder that Warren would buy this because here we have the man who's sold as the number one best-selling book in my lifetime in, in the church. And uh, Rick Warren has embraced this idea, this philosophy, this worldview, not only appearing on EWTN and making lots of ovations about Catholicism, but following and quoting the mystics such as Thomas Merton and Thomas Keating and Henry Nouwen. And he said he was reading their work when he was writing The Purpose Driven Life. There's inspiration for you. You know, if he would just change one thing in The Purpose Driven Life, I would, I'd be willing to at least give him some sort of a, a break. If he would just change the plan of salvation he gives in the book. It is the biggest selling Christian book of our time. He says, just think this nice little thought. This thought about Jesus. And suddenly, now you're a member of the family of God. Where does the Bible say if I just think a nice little prayer that suddenly I'm a Christian? The Bible says, if you confess with the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that he's raised to the dead, then you'll be saved. But that's not what Warren says institutes or initiates salvation. If he just changed that, but he hasn't. That's why 11 years ago I wrote about this, 11 things, and it was 11 years ago, but 11 things why I believe that purpose-driven life is an unbiblical philosophy. Besides the, the watered-down version of things, page 88 in the purpose-driven life, Rick Warren claims that Ephesians 4, 6 states that God lives in everything. No, he doesn't. He created it. He doesn't reside in it. But that's what Rick Warren says because of the version of Scripture he's using. That's the heresy of panentheism. That's pretty serious to me. You know where God has chosen to reside? If you're a Christian, point at your chest. He, he has decided to live in those who follow him through his son, Jesus Christ. That's where God resides. He created the world and everything there is, but he doesn't live, for example, in the blades of grass. But that's what Warren says. Ephesians chapter 4, there's one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in where? You all. And he's talking to the Ephesian church. But he uses that passage and it's a, one of the phony versions that he uses to get it there. Duke Tufty, back to the Unity School of Christianity, he says, on the reality of sin, contrary to some religious beliefs, you are not born a sinner and there is no need for you to be reconciled to God, for you are not separate from or in disfavor with God. Hmm. Rob Bell says, repentance is not turning from sin. Probably the most popular of the emergent leaders. Repentance is not turning from sin. It's a celebration of life in Christ. Really? That's not what I read in Scripture. And he, he furthermore, he goes on to state that anyone who tells you that you need to repent is not talking about Christianity. Well, 
about the authority of the Bible. The Bible is a very holy and sacred book, said Duke Tufty, the leader of this cult, the Unity School of Christianity. One can make the Bible say anything she or he wants it to. It's convenient to say that. An accurate guideline to assist you in your interpretation is to ask yourself for the meaning. <laughs> That's an accurate way to get messed up unless you're full of the Holy Spirit. Just ask yourself for what you think the scripture means. Rob Bell said, this is part of the problem with continually insisting that one of the absolutes of the Christian faith must be a belief in scripture alone as our guide. It sounds nice, but it's not true, he says. When people say all we need is the Bible, it's simply not true. That was in his book, written in his book, Velvet Elvis, page 68. The editor I had for my first book told me, do you really believe everything in this book? And I was shocked when she said it. We were finished with it. I said, yes. She said, good, because once it's in print, you're going to have to stand by it. It's a real mess if you don't believe everything in there. I never forgot that. Well, somebody should have told him that. I'm going to go ahead to the end of the message here, folks. See, there's a form of godliness here. A form of the religion of Christ, as Walter Martin said. But they denied the power thereof. Now, I've just skipped over a whole bunch of the, of the facts and proofs and the comparisons and so on with New Age and Emergent. So I hope you understand. I hope you got enough of it to get to the conclusion here so it makes sense to you. The emergent church is seeking to fix a problem that by all means they have really bought into. And that is that we're in the biblical end days. We are in the biblical end days right now. And they have bought into the idea that we've got to bring the 20-something people back to church at all costs. And it doesn't matter how we do it. As long as we bring them back, that's all that matters. And along the way, they started buying into all these other mystical techniques to do so. But they really helped to fulfill prophecy along the way. I, I believe it's prophetic what we see going on. Think how many people are scoffers saying, where's the promise of his coming? They're helping to fulfill that. They're really helping to fulfill the idea that there would be just a remnant at the end. With all that said, we can't afford fatalism. It doesn't help us. But do the sum of these two things equal this last one? Not at all. Not at all. New Age and Emergent have a lot of the same problems. And they seek to minimize Jesus. Emergents want to redefine who he is. But it's up to you and me to be able to refute them and give them answers. Answers is what people need. Not just telling him something's wrong and not being able to express why. Answers. Now, I'm closing with this. Why is the FedEx truck on the screen? I've used this for a number of years. And I felt like it was apropos this evening. It wasn't something I planned on. When FedEx comes with a box to my house and he runs up to my porch and puts it down, if I see him get his box cutter out and open up the box that is just delivered to my house, I'm wondering what in the world he's thinking. And if he opens that box up and looks in and I can hear him mutter from our office, hmm, well, the people here in this house would never accept that. And he begins to take something out that's been delivered to me. And then he says, oh, that's, that's offensive. We, we wanted to take that out too because that's, they would never accept that. And then he takes something else out and something else out. I'm not calling FedEx on the phone to complain. I'm calling the sheriff because he is stealing from me something all he was supposed to do is deliver. And all God is asking for you and I to do is deliver the message intact with no additives and no subtractions. And that's what we're obligated to. It is our obligation not to try to use our human emotions to say, oh, I just want to get through to them so much. I don't want them to think that God is a God of judgment. I don't want them to think that, that God may not be the God of love all the time that I claim he is. No, we've got to deliver the message. And sometimes that message, it doesn't really feel good on the palate of the human. But that's the message that's going to change their life. Not one that's changed and, and not a message that's changed or that's uh, watered down or soft soaped. If we really love the cultist, I've always said the main thing we need to give them is the gospel. 
not just pat them on the head, let them walk away from our door without challenging their belief system and being able to share the truth with them. The same is true with the people in churches. And I'm out of time, and I'm going to respect that. I just want to tell you, deliver the message intact. And let God sort out the rest, amen? He's the one that's the soul winner anyway. He's the one that knows best. And it's his message we deliver. The most important message the world will ever hear in any form is the one we've been given to deliver. And Father, we're grateful that somebody delivered that message to us that we could hear it and then we could turn to you in repentance and in sorrow for our sin and recognize the only hope is a Savior who rose from the grave. And Lord, if there's anyone sitting in this room tonight who doesn't know the Savior Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in a personal fashion, I pray today would be the day for them that they'd be able to mark it down on the calendar and tonight as they go to sleep would be the night that they can rest and know their sins have been forgiven. It's so simple, Lord, but yet so complex for we humans who think that we have something to do with your salvation when really we are just the messengers. And so, Lord, touch anyone in this room that they would not walk away from here tonight without confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we give you the glory now. Help us remember the things taught that we can be more effective in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.